Um, I joined the Black Panther Party when I was 15 years old. And um, I want to share something and um, uh, on this day, on the day that, uh, that Dr. King was assassinated, I was, living, I was living in the Bronx at the time uh, with my grandmother, uh, Nana, who I affectionately call Noonie. And this was a day that changed my life. This was a day that changed the life of many, many people because when Dr. King was assassinated, a lot of people who had been in the Civil Rights Movement decided that they would then join the Black Power Movement, that they would be more militant and more active about changing things. So I'm going to read to you, if I can, just a little bit from, from the book, from Panther Paper. And uh, it's from Chapter 3. I walked into the Panther office in Brooklyn, 1968. Dr. King had been assassinated in April of that year. Riots and anger fled in ghettos across the country. The feeling on the street was that the stuff was about to hit the fan. Black power was the phrase of the day, and hating Whitey was the hip thing to do. From street corner speeches to campus rallies, Whitey's, in our mind, had gone from being the man to being the beast. Young black students were trading in their feel-good Motown records for the recorded speeches of Malcolm X and the angry jazz recordings of Ornette Coleman. I went down to 125th Street the night that Dr. King was assassinated. Protesters and rioters swarmed the streets, clashing with cops, <coughs> overturning cars, setting trash can fires, and hurling bricks at white-owned businesses. One of the storefront windows was shattered by airborne trash cans. Looters ran into the stores and started taking clothes and appliances and whatever else they could carry. Not everyone looted. In fact, most of the crowd continued to chant, the king is dead and black power. But it was enough for the cops to start swinging clubs, shooting pistols, and making arrests. A cop grabbed me and threw me against the wall. Before he could handcuff me and put me in the paddy wagon, a group of rioters across the street turned a police car over. The cop told me to stay put and ran toward the rioters. I was scared, but I wasn't stupid. <laughs> I took off running in the opposite direction. I blended in with a group of rioters and tried to figure out which way to go. A group of cops headed toward us. Some rioters ran into a clothing store that was being looted. I followed. The cops entered the store swinging clubs and making arrests. My heart pounded as I ran into the back of the store and found a back door leading to an alley. I gasped for air as I ran down the alley and was stopped by a wooden fence. The cops in the alley said, halt, put your hands up. Now in my mind, I froze, I put my hands in the air, and I turned around and faced the cops with tears in my eyes. But my body kept all the butt. I grabbed the fence and scurried over the top of it like a scared alley cat. Two shots rang out. One splintered the wood of the fence near my leg. This gave me the fear and the push that I need to flip over the fence, pick myself up off the ground, and scramble out of the alley. When I got into the street, I kept running. Right past two other cops who tried to grab me. I collided with a group of 20 or so black men in leather coats and army fatigue jackets, wearing afros and berets, standing on the corner in military-like formation. Stop running, my brother, one of your men with a beard and tinted glasses said. Don't give these pigs an excuse to gun you down. I doubled over, heaving, trying to catch my breath. I didn't know this man. But his voice sounded like a wrath of confidence in a sea of chaos. Moments later, two cops ran around the corner. They stopped in their tracks when they saw the militant men. The men closed ranks around them. What are you doing here, one of the cops demanded. Stand aside. The black men with tinted glasses didn't flinch. We're exercising our constitutional right to free assembly, making sure no people get killed out here tonight. But we're chasing looters, the cop retorted. No looters here, the man said. As you can see, you're a disciplined community patrol. You have guns? The cop asked with a tinge of fear in his voice. That's what you said, the man with tinted glasses. I said we're exercising our constitutional rights. The cops took in the size and the discipline of the group for a moment and walked away. By that time, I caught my breath. 
but I was speechless from what I had just seen. Black men standing down, white cops. Hmm. Go straight home, young brother, the man said. The pigs are looking for an excuse to murder black folks tonight. With that, the black men walked on. I scooted down the subway and I rode home. When I entered the apartment, Grandma was sitting on the couch, watching images of Dr. King on TV. Tears fell from her eyes. She didn't even ask me where I had been, and this was unusual, because I was about two hours late getting home. I sat next to her and put my arm around her. And together, we watched TV reports of Dr. King's assassination and the riots. Beautiful. Yeah. Right after that, the next day I went to school and I remember telling my friend uh, that I always would eat lunch with that I was going to be a black militant. I wasn't even quite sure what the word meant, but I just <laughs> know that the black militants were like kind of the cool guys with the afros and the sunglasses talking about black power. So uh, I was like a whole hall monitor in school, so we sat at a table so we could eat first to get into the hall. And I remember telling my friends, yo, I'm going to be a black militant. And one of my best friends was a white kid, a Jewish kid named Paul. And Paul said to me, Eddie, I hadn't changed my name to Jamal yet, he said, Eddie, I don't know if you can say you're going to be a black militant like it's a career choice. <laughs> like you're going to be a doctor or a lawyer. And I was like, no, Paul, you watch. I'm going to be a militant. And then I was trying to figure out what organization to join. And that night on TV, there happened to be a story about the Black Panthers. And the Black Panthers started in California carrying shotguns and law books. And they would police the police because the police in California, in Chicago, in Harlem, at that time when they would stop you, everybody knows about the stop and frisk that happens. You see it on, you see it on television, there's a lot of stopping and frisking of young black and Latino men kind of just because you're black and Latino. Well, in those days, the cops would stop you, frisk you, and just smack you around for no reason. Yeah. I remember being about 11 years old, sneaking into the park one night to play some basketball. The park was closed, and a couple of white cops caught us. And he said, what you doing? We said, we're just playing basketball. And the cops took their nightsticks, and he just said, just get out of here. Get your asses home. And he started just kind of hitting us across the legs and across the butt and chasing us out the park. We're running, and we look at my friend Roger, and he's crying. And you know what we did? Guess what we did? We stopped and we teased him. We're like, oh man, you a punk? You crying? You can't take it? Not realizing that cops, whose job it was to protect us, had just beat us. They had broken the law. They had assaulted us. They were guilty not only of assault, they were guilty of child abuse. But we were so conditioned that if somebody has a badge on, that they can do anything that they want to do to you. Well, the Panthers didn't feel that way. The Panthers said there's something wrong with every time you stop a black person in the community for you to beat them up, take them to jail for no reason. So the Panthers started showing up with guns and with, with law books. The guns were legal because you could carry guns in California if they were registered. And they would read the law to the cops and to the person being arrested. You have to keep in mind how crazy this was, <coughs> how much they were risking their lives. These were ordinary people. They had been college students, Huey Newton and Bobby Seale. California responded by changing the gun control laws. California said, when we meant any citizen could carry a weapon, we didn't mean these crazy people. <laughs> we didn't mean, mean black men and women with leather coats and berets. So they changed the laws, and the Panthers responded by showing up at the hearing. The California state legislature with guns. They stormed into the legislature with guns. This made national news. I'm sitting, I'm watching my grandmother's TV, and I'm thinking, they crazy. <laughs> They got on leather coats, they got on berets, they're carrying guns, they're crazy. Then the news reporter said, the militant Black Panther Party. He said, the police stopped the Panthers' car, and they had more guns in the trunk, and communist literature in the trunk. And I'm looking at the TV, and I'm going, they're crazy. Yeah. <laughs> they got leather coats, they got guns, they're communists. They... I want to join that one. <laughs> I'm going to be a black militant. 
So I'm riding to the train, right, from all the way from the Bronx to Skia out to the Brooklyn office, because that's where our office was, right. Nostrand Avenue, and I'm with two older guys, and we don't know what we're getting into. We're going to the secret headquarters of the Black Panther Party. Now, when you learn about the Panthers a little bit later, there was no secret headquarters. Our offices was open to anybody in the community. You could come in there, you could get books, you could get food, you could get medical treatment, you could get Panthers to come up to your house and fix something. But at that time, I was like, we're going to the secret headquarters of the Panthers. Now, I'm the youngest. I'm 15 years old. I'm with two older guys. So they're trying to, like, get me ready or psych me out. One of my friends kind of leans to me. He was like, yo, um, yo, man, you know the Panthers is like the mafia, right? Once you get in, there's no getting out. And I'm sitting here in the middle going like, there's no getting out. <laughs> but I can't be a punk in front of my boys. So I go like, I don't care. <laughs> the guy on this side says, yo, man, you know you've got to prove yourself to be a Panther. You know you've got to kill a white dude to be a Panther. And I'm sitting there thinking, kill somebody? I'm an honor student. I'm in the church choir. But I can't be a punk in front of my boys. So I sit there and I go, I don't okay. care. <laughs> my other friend says, nah, man, get it straight. Get it straight, man. You ain't got to kill a white dude. Oh, I'm so relieved. I don't have to kill somebody. I'm like, so good. I don't have to kill anybody. He was like, you ain't got to kill a white dude. I'm so grateful. He was like, you got to kill a white cop. <laughs> And you got to bring in his badge and his gun. Well, I'm so like, hey, man, I gotta kill a car. <laughs> we get to the Brooklyn office. There's that Panther sign, that Black Panther sign on the outside. And I walk in, and the brothers and sisters are so cool. They have on like their leather jackets. They have on like their berets. They have on the army fatigue jackets. Some of the women have their head wrapped up in African galays. And the meeting is full, just like this. And they sit us way in the back. The person up front is going over the 10-point program, Lieutenant Ed May. Ed May, I remember. And he's going over the 10-point program. Now, if you read the Panther 10-point program, brothers and sisters, it talks about a lot of things that's wrong in the community. But nowhere in the 10-point program does it say, if you join, you can't get out. Nowhere in the 10-point program does it say you have to kill a white person. Nowhere in the 10-point program does it say you got to kill a white cop. I'm not listening to this, though. I have my own little conversation. In fact, point number one says, we want freedom, we want the power to determine the destiny of our black community. We want full employment for our people is point number two. Point number three, we want decent housing fit for shelter for human beings. He gets to point number five, which is about education. We want an education that teaches us our true history and the true nature of American society. Right in the middle of this man talking about education, I jump up in the back and I go, choose me, brother. All me, I'll kill a white dude right now. <laughs> <laughs> the whole meeting stops. The man up front says, come here, young brother. So as he walks up front, I walk up front, and I'm standing next to him, and he looks me up and down, and he reaches, and he's sitting behind the desk, and he opens the drawer, and he reaches into the bottom of the desk drawer. My heart, is, my heart is pounding in my chest. Because I'm thinking, look how far down he's reaching in that drawer. He's going to give me a big damn gun. <laughs> 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 and he comes up, and instead of giving me a gun, you know what he handed me? Not a knife. A stack of books. Who said books? There you go. Give everybody who said books. He gives me a stack of books. Autobiography of Malcolm X, Soul and Ice by Elders Cleveland, Wretched of the Earth by Franz Fanon, and The Red Book. Red book. Right, quotations from China Mount. Now I'm thinking, this must be a test. <laughs> what do you give me books for? I played hooky to come here. If I wanted some books, I would have went to school. So I think I'm going to answer them back. Now work with me for a minute. You see this picture right here? This is me when I was 15. So if you notice, I have like the little Jackson 5 afro. <laughs> I'm also about this skinny. You follow what I mean? I'm so skinny with the big afro that if they had a black product for Q-tips called afro tips, I would have been a poster child. It would have been like afro tips, clean your ears the black way. 